I am a perpetual traveler through the Bible. Please join me for the next part of my journey through the scriptures. Stay as long as you like and let us together discover a bit more about the Bible. In the previous episodes of the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, we learned all about the first letter of Peter the Apostle. The title of that series of episodes was Hope in the Midst of Suffering. It was written to the believers who had been dispersed through the ancient world and were under intense persecution by the Roman Emperor Nero. Peter's first letter told the Christians that it was actually a time to rejoice. It told them that they should count it a privilege to suffer for the sake of Christ, as their Saviour suffered for them. There is such a considerable difference between Peter's first and second letters that some scholars think that the second letter could not have been written by Peter. This letter is not as well written as first Peter, as if the person who wrote it did not know Greek very well. It is not addressed to a specific group at the beginning, and there are no greetings at the end. Second Peter was one of the books that were not accepted into the canon of the New Testament by the early church at first. This was partly because there were many forged documents which were supposed to be written by the apostles but were not, and partly because of the difference in style from First Peter. However, Peter's favorite words still appear in the second letter as well as the first. He keeps talking about our precious faith and our precious Jesus. Everything was precious to Peter. He used the word five times in his first letter and twice in the second. Also, he refers to his former letter in 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 1. He describes himself as an eyewitness of the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. He states that he knew the Apostle Paul personally and addresses him as an equal. There are words that occur in 2 Peter that are only found in 1 and 2 Peter and in Peter's speeches in Acts. So there are several good reasons to believe that the author of 2 Peter is indeed Peter. But how do we explain the difference in style between Peter's two letters? Personally, I believe that Peter wrote 2 Peter, but did not have Silas as a secretary, as he did with the first letter. Peter knows he needs to write urgently, but he doesn't know Greek well, so the grammar is more clumsy but the meaning is clear. Second Peter was Peter's last letter that he wrote before he was martyred, just as Second Timothy was Paul's last letter. Peter's first letter was full of jubilant hope in the face of suffering. However, the theme of his second letter focuses on how to be faithful in the face of falsehood, how to detect error, how to live in the midst of deceit, and how to distinguish between right and wrong especially when the wrong is so deceptive. The second letter deals with a totally different situation from his first. Although the readers are the same, it is a few years later, Peter sees the urgent need to address dangers inside the church. There are two kinds of threats that the church faces, the threat and the pressure from outside the church, and the threats and the pressures from inside. It is the latter that are far more dangerous. Satan has never destroyed the church from outside. The more he assails the church from the outside, the bigger and stronger it gets. This is why during the first three centuries of Christianity, when Christians were being persecuted, the church grew very rapidly. Hostility from outside was the problem in the first letter. Heresy from within was the problem that was being faced in the second letter. And the same is true for us today, 2,000 years later. Second Peter has only three chapters. It is a very simple and practical letter, as you might expect coming from such a practical, hard-headed Christian as Peter. In the first chapter, the Apostle gives his readers a word of encouragement on what the Christian life is all about. In the second chapter, he gives words of warning on how to recognize and handle false teachers and teaching. In the third chapter, he gives us a word of assurance and facts about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Finally, he draws a conclusion. In this letter, Peter is not trying to encourage believers to have hope in the face of suffering, but rather he is trying to help them to be true and faithful in the face of falsehood. In 2 Peter 1 verses 1, there is a wonderful statement. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, 
to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Saviour Jesus Christ. Consider this. So many of us think of these apostles as mighty men of faith that were far above any of us in their understanding of knowledge and truth. But the apostles never thought of themselves that way. They regarded themselves as nothing more than ordinary believers who had the same equality of opportunity in faith that any other believer enjoyed. We need to realize that everything that a believer requires for handling life and for manifesting righteousness in this world is ours. Everyone who has genuinely come to Jesus Christ has all that it takes to handle all that life can throw at them. Peter says this in 2 Peter 1 verses 3. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him who has called us to His own glory and excellence. Can we believe that? Many Christians today do not. They are always searching for something more, some new experience, some deeper revelation, some different feeling of some kind. They think that without these things, they can never be the kind of Christian they should be. But Peter states in this verse that if we come to Christ, we have Him. And if we have Him, we have all that God is ever going to give us. We have all power and all things that apply to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him. If this is true, there is no excuse for failure. If we have everything in Christ, we only need to know more of Him and we will have all that is required to solve any problem that we may be confronting. When we become a Christian, we do not automatically know and understand everything. However, we do gain more insight and understanding as we grow in the knowledge of Christ. So we can handle all of the difficulties, heartaches and problems and understand life and ourselves. His divine power has already granted us everything we need, but we have not yet discovered it. We have to grow in knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word knowledge is used 16 times in this letter. Peter uses words such as forgotten, remind, refresh your memory, and remember constantly through this letter. He knows Christian life requires constant recollection of the truth. How can we all grow in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ? There are two ways. Firstly, through the promises. 2 Peter 1 verses 4 says, By which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. Peter is not talking about the empty promises of man. Many people seem to think that if they promise to do something and use the words, I promise, that somehow that gives their actions more weight or believability. These are not just fine-sounding words. These are sure and certain guarantees that God has given us that He will honor with all that He has. His very nature and His character is at stake in these words. Every promise is a commitment on God's part to give of Himself. Therefore, the first thing we need to do is to learn what God has promised, and that means acquainting ourselves with the Scriptures. It is impossible for you to find fulfillment in your life and really discover the kind of person God wants you to be unless you understand the Word of God. Even the most educated person who does not know the Bible can make the most dreadful and shocking blunders, and we see it happening all the time. Only when we begin to understand these wonderful promises of God will we understand what life is all about. That is what God's promises are for, to reveal things as they really are. The second part of 2 Peter 1 verses 4 tells us what this effect is. By which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, that through these you may escape from the corruption that is in the world because of passion, and become partakers of the divine nature. There is so much corruption around. We hear of it daily on the news. Corruption means anything that defiles, pollutes and destroys. Unless we have the truth from God, we cannot escape from corruption's effect. Corruption is in the world because of passion, and three passions are at the root of all human evil. Lust, which means a perverted sexual passion which destroys the body. Greed, which is materialism and corrupts the soul. Ambition, the pride of spirit that seeks popularity and fame, and the praise of man. 
These three things are destroying the lives of men and women all over the earth. And these are the three that the truth of God delivers us from, as we understand it and obey it. So discovering God's promises is the first way by which we grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. The second way of discovering all of these things that are available to us is found in 2 Peter 1 verses 5 to 7. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. The structure of this passage is called a sorites in Greek. It is literally a staircase of logic where successive statements build on top of each other. In this case, virtue is added to faith, and knowledge is added to virtue, and so on. This structure is found in only one other place in the New Testament, in Romans 5 verses 3 to 5. Peter is telling us that firstly we should discover the promises of God and everything that we have in Christ, but secondly we need to work at understanding it and applying it in our lives. That is why a sorites is used. We build up our discoveries and apply them in practical terms, step by step, with the people we live with and work with. The result will be we will be kept from being unfruitful and ineffective. 2 Peter 1 verses 8 says, For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the recipe for success as a Christian, holding to the truth and being obedient. If we fail at this, Peter makes a strong statement in verse 9. For whoever lacks these qualities is blind, short-sighted, closing his spiritual eyes to the truth, having become oblivious to the fact that he was cleansed from his own sins. Peter is saying that a professing Christian can fail to grow. Spiritual growth isn't an automatic experience. It is something that needs to be worked on. We can become spiritually blind when our mind is focused on this world, the moment and the present. We can also lose an appreciation for our salvation when we think that it wasn't such a big deal and that we weren't as much of a sinner as another person. We can either move forward or backwards in our spiritual life, but we can never remain the same. Peter's exhortations seem very urgent, as if he knows he is running out of time. He tells his readers in 2 Peter 1 verses 13 to 14 that, I think it is right, as long as I am in this earthy tent, to inspire you by reminding you, knowing that the laying aside of this earthly tent of mine is imminent, as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. But he does not expect us to merely accept his statements, but shows us two assurances that guarantee his statements. Firstly, he gives his own eyewitness account in 2 Peter 1 verses 16. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And Peter says in verses 17 and 18, That was when he received honor and glory from God the Father. The voice said, This is my son, the one I love. I am very pleased with him. And we heard that voice. It came from heaven while we were with Jesus on the holy mountain. This is where the Christian faith rests, on the eyewitness accounts of men and women who were there and who simply reported what they saw and heard and what Jesus did. Secondly, there was another voice, the voice of the prophets of the Old Testament. These men did not write their private opinions or their private inspirations, but they wrote what they were given by the Spirit of God. They accurately predicted events that were to follow centuries afterwards. So it is confirmation by two things, eyewitnesses and prophetic words, and these give a foundation to our faith. In the second chapter, Peter gives us warnings against false teachers and prophets, and this sounds as though it was written recently and not 2,000 years ago. Chapter 2 of Second Peter is almost word for word the same as the letter of Jude. This is not the only place in the Bible where this occurs. Isaiah 2 and Micah 4 also include identical text. 
if you are wondering how this can be, when you come across this phenomena in Scripture, there are five possibilities. Peter borrowed the text from Jude. Jude borrowed the text from Peter. Peter and Jude borrowed the text from somewhere else. Peter and Jude got together and discussed the problem and agreed on the solution and sent it in different letters. And the Holy Spirit gave both of them exactly the same words. All these possibilities are valid, although the fifth option, in my opinion, is less likely because the Holy Spirit doesn't use human beings as word processors. This is not how the Bible tells us that it was written. I tend to think that there was collaboration. Peter was one of the inner circle of disciples, and Jude was one of Jesus' own half-brothers, just like James. So it is highly likely that they knew each other, and both wanted to deal with the corruptions that were emerging in the early church. 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 1 says, But in those days false prophets arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will subtly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. We have reached a strange time in our history where some churches are eager to declare that there is no such thing as heresy. They feel that everything is true and that nobody can be certain of anything, and therefore no one can be charged with heresy. Peter describes these false teachers as those who will subtly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them. These men are not mere atheistic antagonists of Christianity like Richard Dawkins and Michael Shermer. We will always have those. These false teachers will be men who claim to be Christians, who profess to love the Lord Jesus, and who profess to be followers of Christ, yet the things that they teach will deny everything that He is and what He stood for. Many of these false teachers today say that Jesus was not the only Lord, but just one among others. They claim that he is a way to God, but there are many others. They are then corrupting the person of Christ, making a Jesus of their own imagination, rather than the one of the Gospels. But this was not an uncommon teaching in the early church. For example, the church at Colossae was infected by such Gnostic teaching with devastating effects. Many professing believers today think that it doesn't really matter how they live, as long as they have their ticket to heaven. The attitude is that God loves to forgive and will go on forgiving no matter what they do. Of course, this means that Christians go on sinning and take advantage of God's mercy. Such views pervert the grace of God and this leads inevitably to immorality, for they believe that God is not concerned about how Christians live. Naturally, these false teachers will be popular. Many will follow their evil teachings and shameful immorality. And because of these teachers, the way of truth will be slandered. That is 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 2. Just because something succeeds in attracting a crowd of followers, it doesn't mean that it is of God. When people accept what the false teachers say, then it will be easy for people to copy the false teachers' actions. However, Jesus said in John 14, verses 6 that, I am the way, and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The way was the name believers used who follow Jesus. This is found in Acts 9 verses 2 and Acts 24 verses 22. Therefore, Christians should copy Jesus. They should behave in the same way that he behaved. If Christians behave in evil ways, their actions will lie about the character of God himself. Then these people will be insulting God. In 2 Peter 2 verses 3, Peter assures the readers of the certainty of the judgment on these men and recounts three instances from the past which prove that God knows how to deal with a situation like this. And in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle and their destruction is not asleep. God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but he judged them. God did not spare Sodom and Gomorrah when they sinned, but he judged them. And God did not spare the ancient world, but he judged it in the flood. But even with that threat and danger, there is still a promise for the faithful believer. 2 Peter 2 verses 9 says, Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials, and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. 
Even in that situation, God cares for his true children. Peter finally concludes his long if statement that started in verse 4 by arriving at the then in verse 9. The conclusion of this lengthy promise is God's judgment is coming. The false teachers in the church will be condemned and destroyed. There is not a question of if God will repay, only when. If God condemned the rebellious angels and Sodom and Gomorrah and the world of Noah's day, then he won't hold back in condemning those rebelling against him now. This is the negative part of the promise, but there's more to be found. If God saved Noah and Lot, men he declared to be righteous, he will also save those who he declares to be righteous now. God knows how to do both. He knows how to rescue his people, the ones he declares to be godly, from trials. God's promise is clear in this matter. We may be tempted to look at the world and think that those who oppose God are winning. It may seem that standing with God costs more than it's worth. We must never forget that God still sees everything. Destruction will come, but so will salvation. The faithfulness we demonstrate today will be vindicated one day. This is David Wiles, your fellow traveler in Christ, and this has been the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, episode 10.